and welcome to another video. So today we will be talking about complications of nephrotic syndrome and um, please feel free to like and leave a comment if you enjoy this and subscribe. So nephrotic syndrome, um, well firstly I'm going to make it simple and give you the clinically high yield relevant points because um, there are some major major complications that are more important or more significant for you to know. So a quick re recap, what is nephrotic syndrome? Well nephrotic syndrome, remember the ro, nephro in nephrotic, that should remind you of pro in proteinuria. There will be protein urea and it will be more than three grams per day. Okay, it'll be a lot. There's because of the protein urea, you lose albumin in the urine, you will have hypoalbuminemia, and that will then be less than 20 gra 25 okay, grams per liter. And remember, wherever albumin goes, um, that was kind of responsible for just like that vacuum pressure suction motion. The vacuum pressure um, sucks all those things in, just like albumin um, is then responsible for maintaining that oncotic pressure. And without albumin, the fluid will then leak out into the interstitial, causing edema. We have discussed this in another video um, titled All About Nephrotic Syndrome, okay? That's what the title of Nephrotic Syndrome. And remember, there's also a state of hyperlipidemia in uh, Nephrotic Syndrome. So um, loss, what kind of proteins are lost in proteinuria? What does it mean? It means loss of albumin as well as loss of antithrombin 3. Now this is crucial for your understanding in order to then understand later on why um, a certain thrombosis occurs. It's because you're losing your antithrombin 3, your anticoagulant protein. Okay, so um, if you lose your anticoagulant protein, then you're more likely to have activation of those clotting factors, more likely to then activate your um, coagulation. So your first complication is renal vein thrombosis. Renal vein thrombosis is um, occurring because there's a susceptibility, okay? Renal veins are one of the most common sites. It is the most common site. In fact, for thrombosis to occur. But what happens here, the body enters a hypercoagulable state due to the loss of antithrombin 3. Okay, so th that anticoagulant protein is lost. Here it should say, by the way, it should say anticoagulant proteins are lost, not complement pathway, okay? It's just anticoagulant proteins are lost. Okay. okay, so, yep, so when we have our kidneys, as I mentioned, the renal vein is one of the most, it is the most common site of thrombosis to occur, and that makes it particularly susceptible to renal vein thrombosis, and when you have this hypercoagulable state, it's quite easy for this to occur, but it is a very, very dangerous complication, which has severe symptoms as well. And DVT and pulmonary embolism are also um, complications of entering this hypercoagulable state, such as um, in this nephrotic syndrome complications. Now remember, with the renal vein thrombosis, you, that is typical, typically presents with loin or back pain, so it could be back pain, kidney dizzy pain often goes, presents as back pain, hematuria, and fluctuating renal function, okay? This goes up and down their fu function. Now, so also you, in ne nephrotic syndrome, you have proteinuria and hyperlipidemia. So what exactly is the relationship between proteinuria and hyperlipidemia. Remember, nephrotic proteins are lost in the urine and then your liver tries to compensate. So if you have excessive loss of proteins, that will then, um, you're losing your albumin, that will then 
uh, mess up your oncotic pressure. It will lower your oncotic pressure. And then with that, the fluid will just leak out into the interstitium. However, we, albumin is like a vacuum pump. It's sucking in, keeping it all together, keeping all the fluid. Because remember, fluid goes where there's, goes to the more solute area. Okay, so it goes from where there's low solutes to more solutes. If you're losing all the albumin, that will then cause the fluid to leak out into the interstitium and uh, lowers the oncotic pressure, leads to edema. But our liver steps up and starts to produce more and more lipoproteins, okay? And these will then attempt to um, upregulate that oncotic pressure. Another complication of nephrotic syndrome is that there's an increased susceptibility to infections. So it's common for somebody who has nephrotic syndrome to then get strep infection, for example. And this is primarily due to a few reasons, okay? The few reasons are that there is low serum IgG, okay? There's low IgG, you're losing proteins, you're also, so you're not just losing albumin, you're losing immunoglobulins, okay? You also have low complement and low T-cell function. These are very important to know. Okay, now let's have a recap. So you have loss of antithrombin-3. Your antithrombin-3 was important for working as an anticoagulant protein. That then makes it more likely for the body to enter a hypercoagulable state and cause renal vein thrombosis. Um, due to the loss of proteins and immunoglobulins, you have increased susceptibility to infections. And there is, um, so what will our patient present with in nephrotic syndrome? Our patient presents with those typical signs, okay? He will say, doctor, I have loin pain and uh, this increased frequency, sometimes increased frequency of urination, okay? So they'll say that. Also, foamy urine. Now, we talked about this in the nephrotic syndrome video. These are clinically high yield points, each of these. When they say they have loin pain, when they say they urinate frequently, and when they say they have foamy urine. Remember, urinate frequently, it's oliguria. That's the same thing as oliguria. That's the clinical term for it. Foamy urine, that is an indication of, that's the same thing as frothy urine, and it often occurs in nephrotic syndrome because you're losing proteins into the urine and that's um, causing proteinuria, of course, and that's what's giving that characteristic frothy appearance. You always need to consider, as a doctor, what is normal and what is abnormal for your patients. And then if you know the underlying normal, then you will be able to pick out what's abnormal and what is then the physiological process behind it. Okay, thank you so much for listening, and if you enjoyed this, please uh, share your opinion in the likes or comments and subscribe.